So, keeping that in mind, what is Satan trying to do? He's trying to accomplish exactly what the prophet said he would do, and I'll now read two prophecies out of the hundreds that I could quote. The first one being from Ether chapter 8, beginning with verse 23. Before reading this, I should also give you another verse, Mormon 8, verses 34 to 35, where Moroni says, You Gentiles of the last day, of the last days, I have seen you, and I have seen your times. And here's what he said. Wherefore, O ye Gentiles, it is wisdom in God that these things should be shown unto you, that thereby ye may repent of your sins, and suffer not these murderous combinations shall get above you, which are built up to get power and gain, and the work, yea, even the work of destruction come upon you, yea, even the sword of the justice of an eternal God. I want to pause there after that verse to comment on this. First of all, I want you to notice great secret combinations moving abroad in the earth, all of them trying to do one thing. Do what Satan wants done, and that's destroy the power in the people and replace it with ruler's law, a ruler that will obey Satan. Now, that's what's happened. These secret combinations are in every facet of our lives. They are in both of the major political parties of the United States to begin with. This is very easy to document. They are in education, and that is very easy to document as they try to seize control of the schools away from parents and dictate to the next generation what they shall learn in terms of what these other people think is for their good. It is in the labor movement, and there are a lot of wonderful people in the laboring movement, but the labor power is determined to get a veto-proof Congress, which means it will obey our dictates and support our class and none others. That's what a veto-proof Congress is supposed to mean. And you can be against that without being against labor. It is in the churches. And I know of no greater subversive satanical force in the world today than the World Council of Churches. There isn't anything Christ stood for that they aren't opposed to of any significance, that is. It is involved in our programs of welfare, which is supposed to be a system of compassion and President McKay said it was the most diabolical device for grasping power. It was not a program of compassion. It was based on a different principle entirely. It's among our super-rich. They are determined to destroy the Constitution of the United States and set up a one-world order, President Nixon's favorite uh, phrase. We had 134 congressmen and senators sign a declaration of interdependence, all designed to overthrow the Constitution of the United States. Well, it's in almost every facet of our lives. The next verse I want to read is verse 24 from Ether 8. Wherefore the land the Lord commandeth you, who is he commanding? The Gentile saints of the latter days. The Lord commandeth you when ye shall see these things come among you, that ye shall awake to a sense of your awful situation because of this secret combination which shall be among you. Or woe be unto it because of the blood of them who have been slain. And Moroni saw that this would lead to terrible bloodshed. Now, in 1973, the New York Times came out with an article, and it said that Mao Tse Tung was probably the most moral... spiritual, innovative leader of the century. Who do you think would make a statement like that about Mao Zedong, who admitted murdering 12 million people and congressional reports uh, on, based on sworn testimony by people who were over there raised the estimate to closer to 64 million? Who do you think in the United States would call that kind of a man a great spiritual moral leader? The greatest. That's David Rockefeller, president of the Chase Manhattan Bank, head of the Council on Foreign Relations, and probably the most 
prestigious political and economic personality in the whole world. There is no one who can walk into any embassy or any prime minister's office unannounced. I don't know of any other person who can do it, but David Rockefeller can. He's the younger of the Rockefeller brothers. What's he trying to do? He has a plan. He wants to restore ruler's law and force the stupid masses, those are Lenin's words, force the stupid masses to do what's good for them. He has the highest aspirations for the human family. He would force all of them to be well housed, well educated, and well fed, on the assumption that then they will all reach the celestial kingdom or whatever he believes in. In order to help these people, you must approach them on the basic assumption that they're sincere. They're so sincere that some of them would give their very lives to achieve this great monolithic monster of power that we all voted against in the pre-existence. The great revolution of the pre-existence is continuing here on earth. Satan won a third of our brothers and sisters up there, and it's amazing how many are willing to subscribe to those principles here. Well, Moroni says, I, Moroni, I am commanded to write these things that evil may be done away and that, they, that the time may come that Satan may have no power upon the hearts of the children of men. Now, there's an optimistic note. Now, at Kansas City, that was clearly the issue. We had a candidate who was opposed to this strong centralization of authority in Washington and another one who is willing to kind of roll along with it. He talks against it at election time, but other than that, contributes greatly to it. The one who stood for people's law was had the most delegates, but because of a technicality where some states have to vote the majority, it locked up enough delegates so that the man in favor of centralized power won, and he represented the Republican Party. At the Democratic Convention, with practically no resistance, was one who represented total centralization of authority, a uh, program of um, national health, and some other things that have been tried scores of times all over the world, haven't worked anywhere to my satisfaction anyway. Some others may feel differently, but I've watched it in Sweden and South America and England and and any doctor who's here who thinks he'll do better under socialized medicine just needs to take a trip and talk to some of those who've had to work under it. But anyway, that's what he's promised. As of this moment, it appears that the American people have chosen that route. This may work out to an advantage. I have great confidence in the American people. They can be suckered in down to just a certain point. And I use that word advisedly as it means being lured, suckered in, taking the bait. And I've watched these political baits swallowed by our people, which I myself would have swallowed, because they were all the good things that everybody wants. Had not I been alerted by because of my professional assignment that this bait, although pure protein, bite-sized, had a hook in it. And I was so thrilled when I found out that the Founding Fathers anticipated practically everything bad that's happened to the United States and gave us a formula for our recovery. We got some good news for this world. But our people don't know it yet. And that's why President Clark kept saying, we don't need any more prophets for the moment. We just need some listening ears among the saints. So I say to the students, you ready to study? You want to help save the Constitution? At this point, you won't even know who to vote for or who stands for the Constitution, probably. We need to humbly sit down and start studying. All right, now will you remember those two prophecies? That there will be secret combinations to establish rulers' power in our day and that God called upon the saints of the last days to repent and stop sustaining these secret combinations. And we have a command to overthrow them while we still have the capacity to do it. Now, that's enough background 
and I hope, enough of a foundation so that we can now discuss the history of my lifetime in terms of those two prophecies, because that's what I'm going to do. And Brother Ludlow's absolutely right. When I deal with history, I have to give it to you in terms of my best thinking as I have seen it, fortunately not as a young debater in college where I was winning debates on the wrong side, but as a result of 16 years in the FBI and another 25 or 30 years studying every document I could get my hands on on both sides. Now, anything that I say in this lecture today is documented. Naturally, I didn't bring a library to cite everything. But if you're taking notes, you have any question about any point that I make, and, let, and write me at BYU, I'll be very glad to send you the documentation. Actually, most of it is in three different books, which I'll mention in a moment. Now let me just tell you the history of the conspiracy, conspiracies, the great secret combinations to restore ruler's law in the United States. And I so appreciate you staying awake when it's so warm in here. And, and you are awake, and I'm grateful to you, because you can't remember it if you don't hear it. And one of the problems we've had is perspective. We don't have any frame of reference. Somebody comes along and says, well, of course, you know, our participation in World War I was set up for us. What? Yeah, it was set up for us. We never would have gotten into World War I without a lot of preparation and forcing us into it. You're kidding. No, I'm not kidding. All the investigations reveal it. Tell me more. Well, then you've got a frame of reference from then on. You know that World War I was an unnecessary expenditure of money and manpower by the United States. And that's just the beginning. All right. If there were time, I would give you the root history of the secret combination as it grew up among the super-rich. It extends over about 400 years. If I had time, I would give you the, uh, the, the story and the history of the secret combination that grew up in the intellectual circles of the academic world, which extended over a period of about 200 years. Uh, and so on. I could give you the history of each one of these, but that's not so important as the fact that they all combined their strength and came to power the year I was born, 1913. I mean, one calamity hit us after another, <clears throat> beginning in 1913. And uh, little did I know, when I saw the light of day up in that little brown house in Raymond, Alberta, Canada, with the tem temperature 40 degrees below zero, that all these things had already been planted and established in the very year of my birth, which would affect the whole history of the world in the future. In 1913, the power structure not only took over the politics of the country, and it was an election which was very carefully manipulated. In fact, I ought to pause long enough to tell you that the incumbent president, Taft, was opposed to all of these things, and therefore great effort was made to eliminate him. They went to a member of his own party named Teddy Roosevelt and said, You're the man. We'll give you money. Run independent. Smash Taft. And Teddy took the bait. Bite-sized, pure protein, full of hooks. And as a result, he split the party, and that allowed them to throw a lot of money behind the president of Princeton University named Woodrow Wilson, who was a, a benign, lovable sort of person, wanted to help the world, and took counsel from the worst people possible and was elected president. But anyway, that's just a word about J. Edgar Hoover, who by this time was most disturbed by what was happening. Well, J. Reuben Clark was not listened to in or out of the church. And I watched my contemporaries wander away from conference and say, Oh, I wish he'd stay out of politics. And some of those same people later lost their boys unnecessarily in the Pacific, in the Atlantic, in Europe, and on the islands of the Pacific. Now, when we don't have ears to listen to the prophets, we pay penalties. The problem of cause and effect. So, by 1941, we're in the war. We got ourselves a Pearl Harbor. The investigation of Pearl Harbor is so morbid, the way the thing was set up, it was just like the Lusitania. And it was so bad that General Marshall went horseback riding so he wouldn't even be available when it hit. One of my partners in the FBI was the principal conductor of the investigation, much of which has never been published, 
but it was another trap, just like J. Reuben Clark said it would be, to involve us unnecessarily in foreign quarrels. And I ask you today, what did it accomplish? All of Eastern Europe that we fought to save from the Nazis was subsequently given by the State Department to the Communists. And at the Helsinki Convention just, um, what was it, last June, it was admitted that that was all Soviet territory now. We wouldn't even pretend that the captive nations were even entitled to freedom. I just kind of keep in mind that this is all being manipulated by people that have in mind a great new society, a one world order. It's down the trail. You've just begun to see it. The most I can share with you today is what the prophet said. And you read Ether and you look around and say, no, not in my day. Yes, in your day. Even before you were born, it was operating. What are you going to do about your children's day? That's really the question. Now some people say, I'm sorry, I don't have time to study this. That's why we're in the mess we're in. We couldn't even hardly get a handful of people to sit down like the prophet asked them to and give a high priority to spending a little time so that they could call the shots themselves. And that's what I say to my students. You shouldn't have to have anybody doing your thinking for you. You ought to be able to flip the paper and say, there he goes. Yeah, that's the man. There he goes. Now, you should know this, that during World War II, we were set up with the Soviet Union as our ally as part of the long-range program. Toward the latter part of the war, it was agreed that all of the Far East, including China, Southeast Asia, would go to Russia or be in the Russian sphere of, inf of influence. That was all 19, uh, spring of 1945. Even before that, we found that Harry Hopkins, assistant to the president, had shipped about one half of our uranium salt supply to the Soviet Union with the very latest information on how to construct the bomb from the Manhattan Project. It all came out in congressional hearings. Where were the American people? They certainly weren't listening. Harry Hopkins died, so nothing much was done about it, but the Rosenbergs were executed. And if you want to read a blistering sentence statement, read the Jewish judge and what he said to the Rosenbergs, who were also Jewish, as he said, in the names of the untold millions who may yet die because you have put into the hands of potential criminals through your duplicity this terrible instrument of destruction, I sentence you to die. Now they have their children appearing, weeping on the television, pleading with us to somehow undo this terrible mistake that was done to the Rosenbergs. The only mistake that was made is that we never went beyond the Rosenbergs to fix the guilt in the White House, in the State Department, and in the Congress because there were Americans who knew exactly what was being done and supported the whole subversive movement. As we came out of World War II, they gave us the United Nations. When J. Reuben Clark spoke against it at the University of Utah, he was booed. Everybody was for the United Nations, and he said, so am I. But this charter happens to violate everything the Founding Fathers were inspired to set up for free people. It will abuse the little nations, and it will exploit the big ones. 